Uh, and uh, saying goodbye to Birgitte, we are now saying hello and welcome to Svetlana that we have with us from uh, University, let me say correct now, the University of Southern California, the Shua Foundation. And I can see that you are with us and we're just going to make sure that we also get you on the screen. So hang on, Svetlana. I will. Uh, you will take make your talk in English, and uh, yes. um, it's the first of two presentations regarding memories of the past, or what's called dimensions in testimony, which enables people to ask questions that prompt real-time responses from pre-recorded video interviews with the Holocaust survivors and with that i will leave the stage to you welcome thank you um share my screen um okay uh, hello everyone uh, my name is Svetlana Ushakova and i'm honored to be here today as a lead researcher at UC Shows foundation where i oversee content creation and management for dimensions and testimony today i'm going to share with you my presentation through this presentation, we have dealt in the innovative intersection uh, of immersive media and historical preservation, exploring how te technology enables us to engage in meaningful conversation with survivors of the past. My presentation will give you an overview of UC Show Foundation and its interactive program, Dimensions and Testimony exploring its origins, development, timeline, methodology, challenges, and some technolo technological intricacies. Founded in 1994, UC Show Foundation became one of the largest oral history archives. It gives the voices to survivors of the Holocaust and other genocides, the main goal of UC Show Foundation is to collect, catalog, preserve, and disseminate audio, video, uh, audio visual oral history interviews. Now, in its fourth decade, UC Show Foundation has a collection of more than 56,000 testimonies and reaches 35 plus million people each year. Continuing to expand its collection of audio visual oral history interviews. UC Show Foundation launched its first immersive project, Dimensions in Testimony, 10 years ago. In the 1970s, uh, Holocaust survivors began speaking publicly more frequently, sharing their stories with students and other people. This trend gained momentum in the 1990s with the opening of several Holocaust museums and permanent exhibitions in the United States and around the world. Personal interactions with survivors became a cherished and integral part of museum programs for many visitors. Museum visitors and students alike often valued the opportunity to converse with survivors, recognizing the power of first hand accounts. However, by the second decade of the 21st century, it became evident that this opportunity would soon diminish. The idea to employ modern technology to replicate these interactions emerged as a logical solution. Albert initially met with skepticism, even from individuals who later became its advocates and implementers. The preparation for the first interview spent about four years, including a proof of concept interview. The initial interview featuring Pinkett Gooder was filmed in 2014. Since then, the, United, uh, the UC Show Foundation, together with its partners, has conducted 63 additional interviews. While most were filmed in English within the United States, the collection also encompasses interviews conducted in nine other languages across eight different countries. Two interviews were filmed in Swedish in Stockholm in 2020. While the majority of interviews are Holocaust survivors, the project has also included interviews with liberators, children of survivors, and individuals who survived the Japanese occupation of China during World War II. 
unexpectedly, the project experienced some expansion during the pandemic. With the UC, UC Show Foundation team unable to travel, partner organizations, including the Swedish Holocaust Museum, assumed the primary role in conducting on-site interviews, while the Show Foundation team provided remote support. The nature of dimensions and in testimony interviews as an interactive form of testimony primarily designed for educational purposes defines the main requirements and methodology. Here you, can, you will find the most important of these requirements. Some primarily influence specific areas such as content, technology or interactions, uh, while others apply across multiple domains. The practical implication of certain requirements have evolved over time. For instance, maintaining the integrity of interview narratives has always been paramount, initially focusing on how we create and manage content. However, with the advent of generative AI, it has become a critical requirement for the, the technology we employ. Similarly, uh, while providing guidance and additional context for visitors used to be a guideline for museums, we are now developing tools to actively engage visitors and students in virtual conversation with survivors. Uh, let's, um, let's explore more some of these guidelines. As Dimension in Testimony is a, is a program of UC Show Foundation, it, uh, uh, it follows the, to the UC Show Foundation methodology, primarily focusing on preserving the integrity of interview narratives and ensuring a secure environment for them. However, a significant difference exists between traditional oral history interviews and dimensions and testimony. The disparity is rooted in the program's objective to facilitate lifelike conversation with survivors, primarily serving as educational tool. One of the most challenging aspects for both interviews are, and the, for both interviewees and the content team is the requirement for shorter yet comprehensive answers. Despite each answer being a separate clip in the final version, interviews are conducted in one-hour sessions where the interviewer and interviewee engage in, the, in contextual dialogue. Crafting concise responses to questions as, such as describe your childhood or what, you ha what, what happened when you arrived at the camp proves challenging. For the content team, the primary challenge lies in guiding the interviewee without leading or altering the responses while also, also considering each response as said alone, as, as said alone answer. Based on our experience uh, using dimension and testimony in museums and online, we've made some interesting observation about audience expectation and perception of dimensions in testimony. As mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, dimension in testimony was created to compensate for the absence of the offline of -like conversation with survivors. We've noticed that museum visitors and online users, that is even more revealing, are generally very respectful, uh, treating the interaction as they would with the real person. However, the also expect direct and relatively short answer to the early question. This differs from real, real conversation where audience typically accept longer and more indirect responses, sometimes strained from the original question. When people, especially students, interact with dimension in testimony, uh, their expectations are similar to those of each other with a virtual assistant. This was not necessarily anticipated by the creator of the IT and poses a significant challenge for us. To elicit such concise answers during the interviews, we would, need, we would need to constantly interrupt our interviews, ask the same question multiple times, and explain the type of answer we expected. It would destroy the natural flow of conversation and even alterate um, the answer. To address this challenge, we need to manage, um, uh, we need to manage the expectation of the audience explains, explaining them uh, the, how dimensions of testimony is different from uh, other type of virtual conversation. Sometimes we also divide the original answers in multiple parts, uh, making sure that we, uh, that we 
keep the original meaning and context of the answer. Um, as an interactive testimony, dimensions in testimony has to meet current standards for virtual interactions. Unfortunately, I'm not a specialist in, techno in technological aspects of um, dimensions and testimony. I just can only like, give you a very <laughs> general overview of this part. Uh, here you can see three main highlights that describe the technology we use. Uh, we use uh, artificial intelligence for automated speech recognition and natural language processing. Uh, we use a conversational AI by IBM Watson, significantly customized by our software team to define what answers should be played in response to user questions. We don't use generative AI to create or alter answers, but we do use it to automate some of our post-production operations. Uh, for future development, we plan to suggest uh, um, questions uh, that visitors may also ask and incorporate the additional materials and materials and information that would provide context for a more engaged conversation. Um, in closing, I hope that my presentation had uh, shed light on dimensions and testimony as an innovative way to learn about the past, connecting with people who experience the Holocaust and other atrocities and interact with history. From its interception at UC Shaw Foundation to its evaluation into an interactive, powerful education tool, Dimensions and Testimony uses new technology to facilitate, uh, to facilitate meaningful connection with the past. As we navigate various challenges, we remain committed to upholding the integrity of survivors' narratives and providing audience with an authentic and immersive experience. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer your question uh, if you have any. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Very interesting. And I'm amazed how, for how many years you've been working with this. I didn't know that, that it's so many years and so much of research. Uh, we have one question from the chat, from the audience. So mm -hmm. we will uh, ask that one for you. Uh, what happens uh, if someone is mean to or tries to provoke the AI version of the survivors? I can imagine that an interactive exhibition might trigger that kind of behavior in some visitors. Yeah, um, yeah thank you for your question. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it doesn't happen often, and we see that usually visitors, and even online uh, users, they're very respectful, and we still just uh, like rare uh, occasions that some um, unrespectful or like maybe some and inappropriate comments uh, were, uh, were done. So our program, if it's like, if it's not, if, there is, if it's not a museum, if there is no moderator for that, uh, our program have some uh, answers that kind of um, we used to to respond and uh, then say we don't have the answer and we also have answer like this answer like it's not appropriate for discussion that some pre-recorded answers some generic answers that can be used of course it's very difficult to program uh, this kind kind of reaction because uh, we don't know exactly what would be the inappropriate interactions but for some typical one uh, I'm like we have questions about did you have sex or like some, something like this yeah so uh, we do have something like that it's not appropriate for this discussion uh, it's maybe a little bit more uh, more challenging now with the rise of anti-semitism because we can expect some comments and remarks um, yes like um, it's it's more like one by one um, solution, and uh, we don't have much experience yet. So, but like if we have, we just try to um, direct these um, questions to what uh, an answer that would be a kind of generic response to this um, to this remark or comments. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I imagine that you need to to well, what happens in in real time in our time will actually also, you will have to take in account for your uh, memories or the, the conversations that might arise. Um, you were talking a little bit about the, in the beginning, 
there were some people that maybe wasn't so uh, were a little bit against the project, but then after time uh, came with you in the ideas. Um, what have been the biggest challenges uh, with this project? Is it technical or is it more about uh, actually selling this idea that it's a good project to do? Um, in my opinion, the biggest challenge is still ethical questions about uh, using such kind of um, program to represent uh, the Holocaust and other atrocities. If it's ethical uh, regarding the survivors, how do they feel about uh, it? How do they feel uh, being a kind of uh, virtual, um, uh, virtual, uh, virtual, uh, virtual speaker? And it's still like a, it's a question. I guess it's very much depends on um, on the attitude. Some people don't even want to uh, watch any testimony. They just think that books are uh, the best. But we see that, uh, especially for young audience, it's a very important educational tool. And uh, we consider the dimension of testimony in testimony as main as mainly an educational tool. It does not like another challenge. It's an uh, um, attitude of researcher. Uh, I mentioned uh, on one in one of my slides that the difference between traditional rock history interview and dimensions and testimony is that uh, while we're watching traditional rock history interview, we can uh, see the whole process. We can see the whole interactions. We can understand the context of the responses. Uh, we can. Uh, he has a question. It's different for dimension his testimony because we just uh, can listen to the uh, answer and we don't even know uh, what was the question, how 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 this answer was was asked. So it's it's poses the question for researchers and probably it was one of the main um, point point of skepticism in the beginning. So like is it is it appropriate uh, to kind of, um, is it not against the oral history uh, methodology to, uh, to approach, to do such approach? And again, like uh, we are trying to be transparent as, uh, as much as possible. We committed to be uh, honest, we committed to maintain the integrity of our interviews and uh, basically we are open to researchers if they want to uh, to take a look if they want to uh, to see the original material it's not like of course it's not accessible as, as much as traditional history interviews but we try to be transparent as much as possible and we hope that it's explained uh, like it, it helps people to understand that we do not uh, basically that we do not have um, to compromise uh, anyhow the original narrative. Yeah. Um, one thought, uh, you have a documentation mm -hmm. to, to, to do this, uh, uh, that you have like a base for these conversations. Do you, by, do you record the conversations? Do you save those conversations that actually come in uh, how are the, is it saved in an, any in any way? Yeah, well, the whole um, the whole video uh, the video of the entire interview is, is stored. Um, it's stored in our uh, digital repository. Uh, it's not available like by online. It's not accessible by everyone. But if somebody really interested, it, it's it's accessible and like it's, everything is, is stored. Yeah. It's, Oh, exciting. I have a, a, another question for you, Svetlana. Um, I noticed when I tried the, the Swedish web version of the Dimensions in Testimony that they have suggestions of questions to ask. But are there answers that never get heard? Are there questions that never are heard mm -hmm. that you can um, tell us about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and it's, that's probably one of our uh, main uh, regrets that uh, we film about 20 hours of video, and like, it depends that it's like between usually 15 and 20 hours of video. We ask uh, more than, sometimes more than 1,000 questions, and we have such a rich content, but uh, most visitors usually ask the same questions, and like they don't uh, ask specific questions that's specific for the 
intervene, they don't ask, they, they probably just don't know much. And uh, that's why uh, one of the reasons why we decided to uh, create such um, uh, such feature, to add such feature, it's in development, it's not available yet, but uh, uh, such feature uh, would suggest some questions and it's kind of uh, would probably some users would never talk about. And we hope that with such suggested questions, uh, our vis visitors will have an opportunity to uh, explore more of the interview we have. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, uh, for your presentation. We're so happy to have you with us uh, live. It's always yes. so fun and nice. And also thank you for answering our little bit... Um, Tricky Swinglish uh, questions. Uh, excuse me, I, I, I just have a final question. I got a bit curious about how the data itself is uh, made accessible for reuse or copyright issues, because there must be a huge amount of data collected in this project. If someone would like to access it, like for a academic project, perhaps they will make a doctoral thesis about it, or someone would, would like to write a fictional book or make a movie? Can they access it? Uh, do you mean um, original uh, filming materials? Yes, the like original the footage. Um, yeah, uh, again, like I, it's, uh, I guess um, it may be done individually. If somebody really interested, they can ask. And I think like uh, it, 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 this decision may be made. Uh, we also provide, uh, we have such experience that we provide our data uh, to researchers. Uh, and I mean, like the data, how users uh, use uh, dimensions in testimony, because every like, um, every interaction, uh, each log they are stored. And uh, like sometimes um, researchers, they ask us and they do some research based on the interactions. It's also like, um, uh, yeah, like it's not, it's not openly accessible, but uh, if somebody has interest, they can approach the um, Seashore Foundation and the decision may be made based on individual requests. Which formats are you using? Will uh, the sources still be available like 10 years down the line? Um, so uh, our video materials, they store the same way as we store our all other interviews, all our traditional rock history interviews. It's stored. Uh, we have like very, uh, we have very, um, very strict um, requirements, and we comply with them. Our video stored in, I think, in three places, uh, like physically, in case of uh, some, um, uh, in case of some um, uh, catastrophes or like uh, um, something. And uh, we also like they also store in uh, you see yourself the special 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 rooms and uh, yeah like it's yeah so like all video materials we have with the Social Foundation they store in the same very um, very strict way uh, and we do as much as much as possible to preserve um, all the materials we, we have. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. And once again, thank you for joining us.